question of origins does invoke supernatural causes. Well, that's rather obvious. We are told, however, that science disallows supernatural explanations. And so we, have, we must limit ourselves to only that which is natural, and we are told that the best natural explanation for the universe uh, specifically um, is the Big Bang model. And overall, this is part of the evolutionary model. And you, you may hear me use the, use the word evolution tonight, and let me clarify this up front. When I, use, when I say evolution in this meeting here tonight, I'm not talking about plants, animals, natural selection, biology, and so on. I'm talking about the idea within astronomy that planets, stars, galaxies can form by themselves without a creator being involved, just by natural processes, and then can evolve and change further also through those natural processes. Um, and I've been called to task by the other side of this debate um, several times, actually, and one person called me a liar, actually, and said, surely Spike must know that evolution has nothing to do with astronomy. That word is not has no place in this conversation. And the only reason he uses that word is to instill a knee-jerk reaction among his Christian audiences. Well, in my reply to him, I pointed out that in all of 30 seconds searching, I was able to pull up a dozen or so textbooks with the word evolution in their titles. I don't know how well you can see these, but we had the structure and evolution of galaxies, evolution of stars and stellar populations, evolution of galaxies, galaxy formation and evolution, solar system evolution, theory of stellar structure and evolution, and so on. I also pointed out that that particular month that we were having this conversation, um, the Astrophysical Journal, the, the then current issue, had over a half dozen papers in it with the word evolution in, its title, in their titles. And I even managed to find an article where this particular astronomer calling me a liar had talked about the evolution of stars. <laughs> so I said, yes, there is a liar here, but it ain't me. <laughs> anyway, moving on. What we're being told then is that billions of years ago, there was this event called the Big Bang. That the Big Bang produced all this gas, gas formed into galaxies and stars, planets formed in some of those places, one of which we happen to live on today. And here we are looking at it all, trying to figure it out. Well. Again, they will tell you that they had this model all figured out. In reality, though, let's dig a little deeper and see if it actually withstands scrutiny. Let's see if I can back that up a bit. So, so, so we have this timeline, which is supposed to have shown you side by side before it moved. But anyway, moving this way to that way along the axis, we're moving forward in time. So at the very beginning, we had this Big Bang event, again, 13.7 billion years ago, give or take. The early universe was supposedly gas, about 75% hydrogen, 25% of it helium, and that's all there was. That gas then gathered into stars. This took about half a billion years, 500 million years. So 13.2 billion years ago is when stars started forming. Stars then gathered themselves together into galaxies 8 to 11 billion years ago, one of which is our Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Inside the Milky Way galaxy, about four and a half billion years ago, our solar system formed. That's the sun and all the planets that orbits. Uh, that, pardon me, and all the planets that orbit it. <laughs> and of course, one of those planets is the Earth, which we live on today. So the only thing we actually see, of course, in this whole sequence is this. That's the Earth we live on. All the rest of this has been reconstructed historically. Now, does this actually match the evidence? Well, Let's start with the more recent part of this, which is here. This being, in, you would think, the easiest to spot evidence for and see how well it holds up. So our solar system consists of the sun, which is called Sol, thus solar system, and all the planets that orbit around it. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then Pluto got demoted, as I'm sure most of you heard. So, <laughs> so Pluto's down here with all the ragamuffins and, and riffraff. Uh, now, I actually have a whole talk going planet by planet through the solar system. Each one discredits the secular model in a different way. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, we're not going to have time for all that tonight, though. Tonight, we'll limit ourselves just to just a little sample of this. And what we're being told for where this system came from is that four and a half billion years ago, there was this big cloud of gas. From the gas, dust started to condense, and the dust particles were orbiting this central mass, which became the sun. The dust particles then stuck together to become little particles. The particles stuck together to become little rocks. The rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks. The bigger rocks stuck together to become what are called planetesimals, which means little planets, basically big asteroids. And then the asteroids stuck together to become the planets that we see today. 
The minor detail with this whole model is that it doesn't work. Um, if you have a cloud of gas rotating and swirling like this, um, yes, gravity will be in effect within the cloud and it'll start to condense, and yes, you can get dust, and yes, dust particles will stick together. Just look under your furniture for proof of that, right? Um, but once the particles reach a certain size, they no longer aggregate and stick together to form bigger rocks. Their mass and their velocities are such that they start breaking each other apart in the collisions and you start getting rubble rather than asteroids. And uh, we could talk more about this in depth. I'll just limit myself to a couple of quotes. This is from one of my astrophysics textbooks. Once these planetesimals have been formed, again, planetesimals means asteroids, further growth of planets may occur through their gravitational accretion into large bodies, but just how that takes place is not understood. <laughs> And notice that it's page 553 of the textbook. So you wade through 552 pages of equations, and then you reach the, the part where they do this. <laughs> Other people have made similar comments. Uh, this secular astronomer said, how the first stage of this process, primary accretion, works is a fundamental unsolved problem of planetary science. How fundamental is it? Remember, we're talking about the building blocks for all the planets. Without planetesimals, that's it, the whole thing stops. There's no model from that point on. Setting that aside though, let's assume for the moment that they somehow have managed to solve this planetesimal problem, which they haven't, and actually the problem's getting worse lately instead of better. But again, setting that aside, do the planets then match what we would expect if they formed from that cloud of gas and dust? And the answer is no. Um, the first four planets are called terrestrial planets, them being rocky, similar at, to the Earth, which of course is named Terra, thus these are the terrestrial planets. And again, each of these planets discredits the secular model in a different way, but for tonight, let's just talk about the Earth out of those four. Now, of course, the Earth is familiar to us, it's the place we live, it's home to us, but some people have argued that Earth has actually been misnamed, that when you look at the thing, what do you see? Do you see dirt or do you see water? So somebody actually joked that we shouldn't have called this planet Earth, we should have actually called it water. Now about 70% 70, 70 of the Earth's surface is covered with water, and it's hard for us to really understand how much water there is here. If you do a thought experiment, if you could take the Earth and squish down all the mountains and push up all the ocean basins so that the Earth was perfectly perfectly round ball, then of course the water that's currently in the ocean would spread out evenly because it's now a round ball, right? How deep would that water be? Take the ocean water, spread it out on the whole Earth to an even depth, how deep would it be? Now, I might be tempted to think a few inch, or a few inches, a few feet maybe. The answer is over a mile and a half. Tremendous amount of water here on this planet. Now, I'm, I'm raising that point here tonight because it turns out that the secular model says this water is not here. It can't be here. That swirling cloud of gas and dust makes certain predictions about what elements can condense out of the cloud at certain distances from the sun. Turns out we're too close to the sun for water to have condensed out of the cloud here. Therefore, the secular model predicts that the Earth doesn't have any water. But of course, obviously, it does. How do secular astronomers deal with this? Well, for a long time they said Earth got its water from comets. Now we'll be talking a little more about comets here later, but um, a comet is basically a big, dirty snowball in space. And some of you may have may heard the news here, we have comet Ison approaching the sun um, as we speak. It'll actually make its closest approach to the sun on Thanksgiving, more or less. And hopefully, sometime in December, we'll get a nice comet uh, to see at night, if the sky here cooperates. Um, anyway, the idea was, yes, Earth must have formed dry, because the secular model says so, and we know the secular model is correct. Therefore, the Earth had no water. But of course it has water. Now where'd the water come from? Ah, no problem, they said. Comets, which formed way out there at the edge of the solar system, according to the model, and being made mostly of ices and water, then bombarded the Earth, hundreds of millions of them, after the Earth was formed. Thus, there's where the water came from. Problem with this is, though, we've started actually visiting some comets lately and analyzing their composition in other ways. We found out that the comet's water has some chemical differences between Earth's or between the comet and the Earth's ocean water. In other words, if comets were the sources for Earth's oceans, Earth's oceans would be chemically different than what they are. Since the oceans are what we see, they don't match the comets, therefore the water didn't come from comets, therefore the Earth must be dry. But of course it's not. So again, the secular model says the water shouldn't be there. Other issues that we could talk about, Earth has a magnetic field that protects us from, among other things, radiation from space. Now, we don't often think about this unless you're 
into using a compass for some strange reason. Um, not much used today anymore with GPS and so on. But our magnetic field is actually uh, interesting in the origins debate because it apparently is young. What do I mean by that? Well, since 1829, since we really started taking good measurements of it, the total energy in the Earth's magnetic field has fallen by about 14%. Now, do the math on this. It means it loses half its energy every 1,400 years or so. So looking backwards in time then, in 600 AD, 1,400 years ago, the magnetic field was twice as strong as it is today. 800 BC, it was four times as strong. 2200 BC, it was eight times as strong as today, and so on. You see how it doubles every 1,400 years you go back. So you can imagine that think, looking backwards into time, the magnetic field gets pretty strong pretty quickly because of the way this is happening. Now, I want to be clear about something. When I say it's losing energy, I'm not talking about polarity reversals. You may have heard that the north and south poles of the Earth have flip-flopped. That's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the total energy in the field overall. Now, why is this important? Because the strength of the field is related to currents that are believed to be inside of the Earth's molten core. And the, the stronger the magnetic field is, the more heat there must be inside of the Earth's core. So in other words, looking backwards in time, if the magnetic field used to be stronger, the inside of the Earth used to be hotter. Now why is that important? Because is there a maximum amount of heat that the Earth could ever have had inside? Well, yes. You can calculate how much heat would be necessary to actually melt the crust of the Earth. Now, since the crust has never been molten, as far as we can tell, there's no geological evidence for that, that's the most heat that there ever could have been. Working that backwards, that gives us a maximum strength that the magnetic field could ever have had. And then calculating that with the rate of decay that we see within it, and we get a magnetic field that's only tens of thousands of years old, not billions. And again, that's a maximum age. So this works quite well with a six to 10,000 year old Earth. Does not work well with four and a half billion years. And by the way, the Earth is not the only planet in the solar system that this kind of reasoning applies to. The planet Mercury, just in the year 2011, they just made this discovery that it is a similar thing going on. The secular astronomer said, magnetism is almost as much of a puzzle now as it was when William Gilbert wrote his classic text concerning magnetism, magnetic bodies, and the great magnet Earth in the year 1600. 400 years we've been trying to figure this one out. The source of this problem is basically this. Um, if you want to believe in the billions of years and so on, you have to figure out how the Earth can self-sustain a magnetic field over geologic eras of time. They've been working on this for a long time now and have not figured it out for some fundamental reasons. Moving onwards. Orbiting the Earth, we of course have the Moon. And the Moon is unique among astronomical objects and that is the only one other than the Earth which people have walked on. Now, why did people go up there and walk on it? Well, number one was to beat the Russians. Um, number two was to figure out where this thing came from. At the time of the uh, Apollo program, there was actually three competing theories for where the Moon came from. The fission theory, the nebula theory, and the capture theory. I won't bore you with details because, it turns out, when the astronauts went up there and did their sample gathering, this is uh, Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt. He's actually a PhD geologist, as well as being an astronaut. They brought back several hundred pounds of moon rocks with them. And without going into detail, for different reasons, the moon rocks disproved all three secular origins theories. So there was a time in the 70s when secular astronomers could not explain why there was a moon around the Earth, that there shouldn't be one there, but there is. Then in the late 70s, someone said, ah, wait a minute, here's a good theory. Let's say, okay, so the Earth formed without a moon, like the secular model apparently implies, but then this Mars-sized object crashed into the Earth early on in its history, several billion years ago, and all the debris sprayed out into space. Some of, it went, some of it came back down to Earth. The rest of it, though, made like a ring around the Earth, and then that ring formed into the moon. That's why we have a moon today. Now, if you look in the textbooks, the science media, the science museums, whatever, you'll be told this, it, we know this is how it happened. Problem is, we know this couldn't have happened. Why? Because we, some scientists recently went back and reanalyzed some of these samples, and they found water in some of the volcanic glasses. Now, this was looked for in the 70s as well, but technology back then wasn't as good as it is today, and it was missed. So here in the early 2000s, some people said, you know, we got better, better instruments now. Let's go back and re-look re at some of those samples, see what's there. They found water in some of the volcanic glasses. Now, water in soil samples is not a big deal. Okay, let me, let me explain a minute first here. 
If this had happened, there would be no water on the moon today. Why? Because this collision was violent enough to have vaporized any volatile elements, including water. So if this is true, if this model is true, then the moon would have no water on it whatsoever. Now, there's water in soil samples. Now we knew that, but that was explained away by meteorites brought in the water after the moon formed. Problem was though, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, now they found water inside volcanic glasses that we have samples of. And where does the volcanic material come from? Inside the moon, which is where the water can't be if that collision had happened. So it's been known since uh, 2008 was when the, they first started making a ruckus about this, five years or so now, that this model is actually impossible, yet this is the one still being presented to the public. Why is that? Because they don't have an alternative. Now we wouldn't want to admit that, would we? Moving onwards. The four largest planets in the solar system are gas giants. We have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And here's the Earth for scale. Uh, we could spend most of an hour talk just talking about these four planets. Lots of fun stuff here, but we only have a few minutes. The largest planet among these four is the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter, of course, is famous for its giant red spot. This is a storm system larger than the entire Earth. So imagine how violent that would be. Imagine a hurricane bigger than the Earth. Um, and it's been there for as long as we've been looking at the planet. Several hundred years now. At least I should say as long as we've been looking at it through telescopes and can see such a thing. Now Jupiter is interesting. Here's a Earth for scale. Because uh, we recently started analyzing the composition of Jupiter. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. To make a planet this big requires a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> Remember I told you that the, the, the solar nebula model cannot produce the planetesimals, the building blocks, to make this. And so, right out of the gate, um, the massive amount of stuff necessary to make this planet is missing. There's other issues with Jupiter too, though. We recently started analyzing its composition and found that it has a lot more of certain elements, these here, among some others, than it's supposed to according to the secular nebula mo uh, solar nebula model. This model makes predictions, like I said earlier, about what elements can condense out of the cloud at what distances. Jupiter cannot have these elements that it apparently has if it formed at the distance where it is. The only place in the solar system where these elements could have formed is three billion miles further out, out beyond the orbit of Neptune. So you have a couple of choices here if you're a secular astronomer trying to explain this. Jupiter could not have formed where it is. So that either means it formed somewhere else and then moved and if so, who moved it? <laughs> or the building blocks formed somewhere else and then moved inward before they formed Jupiter, but if they had done that, they would have lost those elements on the way in. So the secular people are scratching their heads now trying to figure out how to make this planet because it shouldn't be there with this composition that it has, but of course it is. And that's why you see quotes like this in the secular literature. Jupiter is the largest of all the planets, but results in Nature, scientific journal by that name, now reveal the embarrassing fact that we know next to nothing about how or where it formed. Another guy said this, I don't think the existence of Jupiter would be predicted if it weren't observed. <laughs> Moving onward, further up from Jupiter we have Saturn. Saturn of course is famous for its beautiful rings. Uh, rings are also causing some head scratching in secular circles nowadays because they're realizing that the rings are too bright to be as old as they're supposed to be. As Saturn moves through the solar system it's gathering uh, particles and so on as it moves through space. And over time, those rings would darken as they gather dirt, is what it's called. Not the soil you see outside, but anyway. Point is, the rings, if they were actually these billions of years old, would be dark, but they're not dark, they're bright, therefore they appear to be very young. But how can we have young rings on a planet that's billions of years old? Hmm. Saturn uh, is another uh, um, good illustration of something called the migration problem. Saturn, of course, is a very big planet, second biggest in the solar system, second only to Jupiter. And it turns out that when you have planets this big forming in this cloud of gas and dust that allegedly started everything, the planetary masses, as they're growing, are interacting gravitationally with this material that they're moving through. It's kind of like trying to swim through a swimming pool full of molasses. It slows you down. So as they're plowing through this disk, they're slowing down and losing energy. In an orbit, when you slow down and lose energy, you move inward. Turns out these planets are 
good examples, of, like I said, of something called a migration problem. Both Jupiter and Saturn should have migrated all the way into the central mass, otherwise known as the Sun, and merged with it before they finished forming. So the migration problem says that these planets shouldn't be there. As this uh, press release said from Astronomy and Astrophysics, theories predict that the giant protoplanets, proto meaning new, forming planets, will merge into the central star, crash into the sun, before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Well, yeah, that would kind of ruin things for you, wouldn't it? Yeah. Talk about a major embarrassment for planetary scientists. There, blazing away in the late evening sky, are Jupiter and Saturn the gas giants that account for 93% of the solar system's planetary mass, and no one has a satisfying explanation of how they were made. Well, that last part's not true. The Bible has a very satisfying explanation for how they were made. But since they've excluded that from the discussion, they're left with... <laughs> so to summarize the secular model's um, predictions for these planets, it's that they aren't there. Of course, they are there, so that's a bit of a challenge. Saturn has a, along with Jupiter, Saturn has a lot of interesting moons. I'll talk just about two of them here tonight. Uh, this little moon here is called Enceladus. It's actually the brightest object in the solar system because it reflects the most, the highest percentage of uh, solar energy back into space. Now, Enceladus is inter interesting because, if my computer would cooperate, these are Saturn's rings viewed almost edge on from a spacecraft. And here's Enceladus. And can you see the little smudge at the bottom there? That smudge is unexpected, and we, we took, started taking close-up pictures, we found out Enceladus has water geysers coming out of its south pole. It's shooting water and ice out into space. Uh, so with false colors added, you can see how much material is um, being sprayed here. Actually, they, they figured out that uh, Enceladus's neighbors, Saturn, some of Saturn's other moons, are brighter than they otherwise would have been because Enceladus is spray painting them with ice and snow. The problem is Enceladus is a small moon. It should have cooled off from its formation billions of years ago if it were really billions of years old. So it shouldn't have this energy to be geologically active anymore. The fact that it does have a ge uh, is geologically active means it does have the energy, which means it apparently wasn't formed all that long ago. Does that chain of reasoning make sense? So people are, are trying to explain, and, and they'll say, well, there's tidal energy from it being caught in a gravitational tug of war between Saturn and some of the other moons and squeezing it. And some of that's true. You can supply some of the energy, but you can't supply all of it. So Enceladus is a pretty good argument for um, a young solar system, assuming that it formed at the same time the solar system did, which is what the model requires. Along with Enceladus, Saturn has another moon called Titan. And you'll see this photograph here looks fuzzy. That's not because it's a bad quality picture, it's because the moon actually looks that way. It has an atmosphere. And in fact, it has an opaque atmosphere so that we can't see through it from here. We can, however, observe how sunlight bounces off of the moon and uh, gives us a few clues about what's in the atmosphere. And one of the things that's there is methane. Now, this is interesting because it turns out sunlight breaks methane down into ethane and some other chemicals. And it does so fairly rapidly. You can calculate that it would take only 10 million years to use up all the methane to break it all down and it all goes away in Titan's atmosphere. Now for perspective, Titan is supposed to be four and a half billion years old. And a billion is a thousand million. So it's supposed to be 4,500 million years old. But methane would only last for 10 million years. So it's 4,500 versus 10. So if Titan was older than 10 million years, the methane should have all been gone, but it's not gone, There's, it's still there. Ah. Not a problem, secular scientists said. There must be just a reservoir b below the atmosphere that we can't see that keeps replenishing the atmosphere with more methane. Then someone figured out, well, okay, um, for that to be true, we would need, of course, a lot of methane to last four and a half billion years. We would also have a lot of ethane built up on the surface from four and a half billion years worth of methane being broken down. Does that make sense? Now, Titan is far enough away uh, from the sun that it's very cold, and methane and ethane on the surface would be liquid. So people figured out that Titan being, because we know it's four and a half billion years old, there should be a global ocean over a kilometer deep of liquid methane and ethane on Titan's surface. The problem was, once we got there and actually sent a lander through the clouds, we found out that the surface is dry. <laughs> this is what the surface looks like. There's no global ocean. Now, people are arguing now about, well, maybe the methane to keep resupplying the atmosphere is frozen into the soil or some other place where we can't really see it. 
Um, that's missing the point, though. The point is, where's the four and a half billion years worth of ethane from all that methane being broken down? That's the thing no one wants to talk about. It ain't there. Moving onwards in our tour, we have the planet Uranus. Now, Uranus is fun for several reasons, one of which is that it apparently orbits on its side. What do I mean by that? Well, this is the planet, how it looks. You see, it's fairly nondescript. When we got close enough to take some good pictures and added false colors to bring out detail, we saw that the pole is not here, like North Pole, South Pole, that we expected, like all the other planets are. Uranus's poles stick out the sides. So whereas all the other planets spin like tops, when they go around the sun, Uranus rolls along sideways like a ball. <laughs> now, the secular model says it can't do that. It shouldn't have formed that way. Um, so they, a secular astronomer will tell you it formed the correct way, according to the secular model, and then got knocked over later by a big collision of some kind. Um, the problem is it has a, a nice system of moons that orbit its equator this way rather than this way. And, and how do you produce a system of moons and maintain it through that nice massive collision is a real challenge. But I like to focus on something else here this evening. Along with its next door neighbor Neptune, it turns out that neither of these gas giant planets exist at all, according to the secular model. Here's how an article in Astronomy Magazine explained it. They said, Psst, astronomers who model the formation of the solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the sun. The problem is this. These are the planets on the outer edge of the solar system. It takes a long time for them to make it around the sun once. And you need to go around a certain number of times orbiting through that mythical disk of gas and dust to collect enough material to build planets. These planets being so far away, moving so slowly, didn't get enough passes through the disk to build up enough stuff to make planets. Uh, people have actually calculated how long you would need to build those two planets, and the answer is 10 billion years, which is more than twice as long as the solar system is supposed to be, even if you want to believe the secular model. So, again, according to the secular model, these two planets don't exist, which you would think would be a problem. Now, for those of you who are interested in science and study astronomy, who heard about this in the science museums or the PBS programs or Discover Magazine or no, no hands go up, right? Why? If the planetary scientists know this stuff. You know, all the quotes I give you in my presentation, by the way, are all from secular people. I'm not quoting creationists here. I want, I want you to hear the, you know, their own words, what, what these models imply. But again, this information is not making it down to be consumed by the public. As this astronomer said, it's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. <laughs> so far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. I like that phrase, come up with a scenario. It really reveals a lot of what's going on here, right? Especially, this is true in all secular origins scientific discussions, but especially in astronomy. People say, well, look, I made a simulation that proves that it actually happened that way. Well, no, it doesn't prove anything. All it proves is that you made a computer simulation. Over and over again, we see that a lot of these people seem to believe that just the mere act of coming up with a story tells you something about that it actually happened that way. I like Uranus and Neptune because it shows that this, this doesn't even have to be a good story, does it? The secular model says the planets can't be there, but they are. Now, I think if your job was to make a secular model to explain how everything got there, and your model says they aren't there, could you have done a worse job? <laughs> but rather than acknowledging their creator, the possibility of creation, evolutionists are clinging to a story that denies the very objects they're supposed to explain. I think that's significant. On the outer edges of the solar system, we have these little objects called comets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a comet is basically a big, dirty snowball out in space. This is a photograph of the Vilt 2 comet. It's about three miles across, so that gives you an idea of how big these things are. Some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, but that's roughly the, the proper size. Now, these are interesting in the origins discussion because of uh, how comets work. For most of their orbits, comets are far from their sun and pretty boring objects. We can't see them because they're small and dark. But as they approach the sun, the sunlight heats them up, and the ices within the comet start to sublimate into gas. The gas comes out in, a, in jets, and then this outjetting gas and these eruptions that it has forms a nice pretty tail that we see from Earth if it's a nice looking comet and not a dud, which they sometimes are. Now, comets are pretty, but also, in a sense, tragic, if a snowball can be tragic. Um, because every comet you see is doomed. 
Right now, like I mentioned earlier, as we sit here, there's a comet approaching the sun. Um, it's another few days, it'll reach its closest, and we might get a really good show in December. Why do I say might? If anybody following the news, what's, what's the biggest question about Comet Ison about whether or not it'll be good in the sky? Will it survive approaching the sun closely? As a comet approaches the sun, it heats up, it loses material every single time. If it orbits a bunch of times, um, well, now you have a problem, for that matter. Depending on how close you come, even once might be enough to do it. But you lose enough material and the comet breaks up into, into fragments, as this photograph here shows. We've actually observed this process happen with several dozen comets now. Uh, sometimes comets will, will not be broken up by this process only because they interact with the sun gravitationally in such a way that they get thrown out of the solar system completely or because they happen to crash into Jupiter or some other planet along the way. But w whatever those three fates the comet has, either way it's, you know, curtains for the comet. Now, I'm bringing this up here in our talk tonight because certain comets, short period comets, come back and orbit the sun fairly quickly, in the 200, 200 year period or less. A comet can only survive so many trips back to the sun before it's gone, one way or the other. And people have calculated that short period comets can only last about 10,000 years before they will all be gone. Now the secular model can't make comets after the very beginning part of the model. So once the beginning's done, no more comets, no more comets form. Therefore, if the solar system were more than 10,000 years old, we shouldn't see short period comets anymore. But we do see short period comets. Why is that? Well, the latest explanation for this, I actually have a news story about this that I didn't add my, to my slides here, is that, well, here's how it all happened. The sun formed in the big cloud, of, big cloud of gas with a bunch of other stars next to it as neighbors. And I should uh, mention something else. Uh, in addition to this age problem, astronomers also have a problem with producing other types of comets, not, not even the ones that come back quickly. Um, their model can produce only about 6% of the amount of comets necessary to explain the number that we see. So number one, comets shouldn't be there anymore if they're really billions of years old. Number two, they shouldn't be there at all according to the model because the model can't make enough to produce the ones we see. So the, the current secular explanation for this is that our sun formed not by itself, but with a bunch in a star cluster with a bunch of other stars next to it. Even though our sun couldn't form enough comets, not a problem because the other stars made them. And then our sun stole them gravitationally. And the news story said, uh, this guy ran the simulation, he says, it's hard to imagine this not happening. It's like, well, okay, wait a minute. Where are the other stars that form next to the sun? You know, they ain't there now. Well, they went away somewhere. Where, where's the evidence for them ever having been there? Well, there isn't any. Why did the comets all get captured by the sun? Don't the other stars have gravity too? Is there a one-way comet valve out there in space somewhere? But it's hard to imagine it not happening, is what he said. See, that's the problem with being a creationist. I don't have enough, a good enough imagination to see all the evidence for evolution. If I had better imagination, then I would believe in evolution. Anyway, bottom line for all this, again from my astrophysics textbook, thus far we have seen that we know very little about the development of the solar system. To sum up, I think that all suggested accounts of the origin of the solar system are subject to serious objections. The conclusion in the present state of the subject would be that the system cannot exist. So this step in the timeline we see doesn't fare so well when it actually is scrutinized. Let's go further back. What about star formation? I mean, our solar system is one little speck in, our, in this vast universe we live in. The primary component of the universe is stars, really, if you think about it, because they're stars and they, you put them together, you get a star cluster, you make a bigger collection, you get galaxies. I mean, stars, in a sense, are the building block of pretty much everything we see. Not everything, but most of it. So you would think then, if the secular model is worth its salt, that it should be able to explain where these objects came from. Now, stars are basically big hot balls of gas out in space. So this should be pretty easy to explain where they came from, or so we are told. We're told that there's all these clouds of gas in space, 
and gas being made up of stuff, matter, physical material, gravity is therefore going to have an effect here. So all the little particles of gas are going to pull gravitationally on all the other little particles. Now, there's not much gravitational force between two gas particles, obviously, but when you have a large enough cloud, then they will all be pulling on each other and they will gravitate toward their center of mass. And then this cloud of gas will collapse under the force of gravity. What happens when you get gravity, uh, pardon me, when you get gas in a smaller and smaller volume and start squeezing together? Remember your chemistry, what does the gas do? It heats up. So heat it up enough and pretty soon you get one of these. You get a star. But there's a problem here. Gravity is not the only force, the only effect in play inside of these gas clouds. And to illustrate this, I have a very expensive piece of astrophysics test instrumentation here. No extra charge. It's a can of compressed air. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Spike, were you really dumb enough to pay good money for a can of air? Absolutely. Why? Well, because it's a good illustration. I have in my hand a uh, system of high pressure gas in a lower pressure environment, the room, right? Now, when I squeeze the, the trigger, I open up a passageway between high pressure gas, low pressure gas, and what happens? Gas comes out. Why doesn't the gas go in? Why is no one concerned that when I open up the passageway, instead of gas coming out, all the gas in the air in the room gets sucked into the can and we all asphyxiate and die? <laughs> doesn't happen, right? Why? Because gas always flows from a high pressure concentration to a lower pressure concentration until it's equalized. That's what gas pressure does. Now, gravity is an effect in this, yes, but gravity is much weaker than gas pressure. That's why gas comes out of the can instead of going in. That's why in the clouds, turns out gas pressure dominates over gravity and gas clouds don't collapse under their own self-gravity, they dissipate. Now, sometimes people, when I say that, people will say, well then how come, how come there are stars then? Because you told me a moment ago a star is a ball of gas. Yes, but a star is already dense enough which makes gravity strong enough to hold it together. We're talking about gas clouds that are not dense yet. And gravity, when it's that diffuse, is very weak and gas pressure prevents it from collapsing. Do secular astronomers know this? Yes, they do. And they have several proposed solutions to this. Compression, cooling, and collisions. So let's look at this briefly. Uh, compression happens when you compress the cloud of gas somehow. Uh, let's see, like in this, you have a supernova explosion go off and the shock front from the supernova compresses the gas cloud enough that makes gravity stronger and strong enough that it then takes over against the gas pressure and stars start to form. So to do this, you need a supernova explosion. Supernovas are big, powerful things. Uh, the Crab Nebula, for example, is the leftover of a supernova that went off in the year 1054. So big, violent occurrences in space. Effect number two is from cooling. When the supernova happens, not only does it compress the cloud, but it also blows a lot of particles into the cloud and cools it down. An analogy I like to use here is if you have a, a pot of water that's just barely beginning to boil and you dump a bunch of rice into it, what happens? The water stops boiling, right? Because the rice absorbs some of that heat and so the water can't boil anymore. Same thing here. You blow dust into the cloud, the dust cools the cloud down. When you cool down a gas, its volume shrinks, its pressure decreases, which means gravity can then take over against it. And then effect number three is collisions. If you have galaxies colliding or something, crunch things together and you get more compression. So gas clouds, when galaxies collide, you can, you can get stars to form along the collision front, which in this case would be along here. Now, those of you who are paying attention may have noticed a problem common to all three of these explanations. You need either a supernova explosion or grains and particles to be blown in or galaxies colliding to form stars. What is a supernova? Well, a supernova is a star that explodes. Certain stars, when, when they reach certain stages in their development, will explode. Grains and particles, where do they come from? Well, they had to be made inside of stars uh, as well, it turns out. The Big Bang model can only make gas. It can't make this solid material. The solid material had to be made by development inside of stars. And of course, galaxies are nothing but big collections of stars themselves. Does anybody see the problem I'm getting at here? What do all three require, explanations require? Stars. You need old stars to make new stars. So what does that remind you of? <laughs> right? It's the classic problem. Don't secular astronomers recognize this? Yes, they do.
The process by which an interstellar cloud is concentrated until it's held together gravitationally to become a protostar is not known. Literally hundreds of ideas on how stars are formed have been advanced in past decades. However, we are still far from any real solution. Oops. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. Again, who heard this on PBS, Discover Magazine, pick your science media? Nobody, right? Yet, wouldn't you agree this is a pretty fundamental problem? Yeah. Take away stars, what do you see in the sky? So what you aren't being told about star formation is that it requires gravity to pull the gas clouds together, but that's a very weak effect when compared to gas pressure, which will actually force the clouds to disperse. All the secular explanations need old ones to form new ones. Thus, the evolutionary model says stars shouldn't exist. So what about galaxies then? Well, if a galaxy is a big collection of stars, and it is, that means if you can't make stars, you can't make galaxies either, right? That's why a completely satisfactory theory of galaxy formation remains to be formulated. <laughs> Collect clusters. Well, if you, don't have ga if you don't have stars, you don't have galaxies, then you don't have clusters either. It's always been difficult for astronomers to explain why stars are clumped into galaxies instead of being spread out more uniformly in space. There shouldn't be galaxies out there at all. And even if there are galaxies, they shouldn't be grouped together the way they are. The problem of explaining the existence of galaxies has proved to be one of the thorniest in cosmology. By all rights, they just shouldn't be there. Yet there they sit. It's hard to convey the depth of the frustration that this simple fact induces among scientists. The formation of galaxies and larger scale structure remains TMIUPIMA, the most important unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. That's good to know. So what you aren't being told about galaxies is they shouldn't be there either, yet of course they are. And again, I'm giving you just a, a brief overview of all these subjects, and I apologize for speaking as quickly as I do, but I want to get you exposed to as many of these ideas as I can. For tonight, we'll just have to summarize and say, well, the stars shouldn't be there, and if there's no stars, there's no galaxies, and if there's no galaxies, there's no Milky Way galaxy, which is where we live. What if we go all the way back to the beginning, though? Does the secular model do any better there? I have a hard time seeing the clock from up here. Hi, right, did you notice what time we started? I know we started late. I, I, got, I got 15 minutes? Okay. Well, the Big Bang model says that in the beginning, there was nothing. And then it exploded. <laughs> exactly. What exploded? Nothing exploded. How can nothing explode? Well, nothing can explode, and nothing did explode, which is why there's everything instead of nothing. See, isn't that clear? Stephen Hawking, famous cosmologist, explained, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. He then went on to explain that the laws of gravity and quantum theory allow universes, notice the plural here, universes, we'll talk about that later, to appear spontaneously from nothing. So he is appealing to laws of physics, gravity, quantum theory, and so on, by which universes can create themselves. But wait a minute now, is a law of physics a thing, or is it a, you know, what is a law of physics? How much, what does a law of physics feel like when you hold one in your hand, or what does it look like or smell like? I mean, these are stupid questions. A law of physics is not a thing, it doesn't have creative power. A law of physics is merely a formulation of a pattern of behavior that we have observed in the universe, right? If I, if I open my fingers, the laser pointer will... Why? Why do you know that? Gravity. gravity. What's gravity? I, I, don't, I don't see gravity. I, don't, I mean, there's, I don't feel gravity. Gravity is just a pattern of behavior that we've observed in the world around us, right? And it so, it so works out that the universe acts consistently where we can, we can do an experiment over and over again, measure how it works, produce a mathematical formulation and description of that, and put a label on it like gravity. But gravity is not a thing, it's a description of a pattern of behavior of the universe. Before the universe existed, could there be a pattern of behavior for the universe? Can the universe behave before the universe exists? No. So there, there were no law of physics before the universe existed. Therefore, they could not create the universe. Nor could the fundamental forces within, uni within the universe, within physics rather, do it either, because something can't create itself, right? A law of physics can't create a law of physics. It can't create the universe that produces laws of physics. The forces within physics can't produce physics itself. Something can't create itself. 
because in order to create something, the creating thing must first exist, right? Self-creation means it has to exist before it existed, which of course doesn't make sense. Nor can you go from nothing to everything because nothing can create nothing. Nothing can do nothing. From nothing, nothing comes, <laughs> right? R.C. Sproul once said, if there was ever once truly nothing, there could never be anything. Which I thought that was a good formulation. And Phil Fernandez put it this way. I like his explanation. He said, you can't tell me nothing made everything. I know too much about nothing. <laughs> now, some people say that if you wait long enough, even the extremely improbable event will occur. Well, that doesn't work either because time itself didn't exist before the Big Bang happened. So there was no long enough to wait because there was no waiting, no time within which to wait, nor was there a place to wait at if that makes sense. No context. <laughs> Moving onwards. Big Bang also violates some very fundamental ideas in physics. Um, probably the most fundamental principle, if you've ever taken a physics class, is the conservation of mass energy. Saying that energy and matter can't be created or destroyed. You may have heard E, e equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times a large number, the speed of light squared. Now we can change the form things are in. We can convert matter, stuff, to energy. Right? The most efficient way we know to do that is a nuclear explosion. A little amount of stuff produces a big amount of energy. We can go the other way too and take a lot of energy and make a little bit of stuff. We do that in particle accelerators. They get little chunks of atoms whizzing around and smash them together. More particles come out of the collision than went in. All the energy that you put into getting them to whiz around gets transformed into energy. But my point is we're transforming the state that this is in, but we're not creating or destroying any of it. The, the total amount of it in the universe stays constant. Which again is the most fundamental principle in physics really. If you ever take a physics class, pretty much every problem is solved by first assuming that this is true, writing an equation accordingly in the context of that particular problem, and then solving it and hopefully you get the right answer. So the most fundamental idea in physics though is violated by the Big Bang, because the Big Bang says everything came out of nothing. All the energy, all the matter came out of nothing, was created from nothing. Now, talk to a secular astronomer or cosmologist and say, how could nothing make everything? Doesn't that violate physics? He says, ah, you silly creationist, you don't understand the power of the secular model. He wouldn't use those words, but anyway. He, wouldn't say, he would say science. You don't understand the power of science, because we don't do science, he does science. See, nothing was able to make everything because everything is actually nothing. What does that mean? Well, cosmologists now model the universe in such a way that if you add up all the energy and matter and you get a number, let's call the number x, and then you calculate the amount of gravitational potential energy in the universe, you get another number, which also turns out to be x. But you can do that in such a way that this number is negative. Gravitational potential energy can be modeled to be a negative value. So if you have plus x and then you add a negative x, what do you get over here? Zero. Zero. So they say, see, every nothing didn't really make everything because everything is really nothing. Nothing on a net basis, nothing was actually made because everything in the universe cancels itself out. So this is, this is how this problem is explained today. The problem is in the real world such a thing doesn't work. And I'm showing you a picture here of a speaker, a loudspeaker. Um, these things are getting kind of rare nowadays now that everybody's got these little things in their ears. But uh, When I was young, I mean I love music and I, I used to do a lot of electronics with uh, audio systems and early on I worked in a project um, where a particular part of a speaker circuit had to power the rest of the circuit and to do so it had to produce two voltages plus 40 volts and minus 40 volts so imagine a circuit with two wires coming out of it and this the purpose of the circuit is two wires plus 40 over here and minus 40 over here and if minus voltage sounds weird to you don't worry about it that that, that can work with electronics just how you define the ground but anyway Audio circuits are, co are commonly designed this way because it makes it easier to design loudspeakers to do certain things. Anyway, point being, I could argue that my circuit on a net basis produced nothing, right? Plus 40 minus 40 equals zero. Yet, for some reason, this thing didn't work unless it was plugged in the wall. If it was working, I yanked the plug, it stopped working. Why is that? Well, because the universe does not spontaneously diverge into counteracting positive and negative values unless, number one, there's an intelligent designer who created a machine to make it do that, and number two, you have a source of energy to drive that divergence and keep it going, and number three, there's a source of energy to draw from from which you must expend to make it do that. Does that make sense? So yes, you can point to physical systems where things diverge into plus and negative, 
But quantum mechanics allows you to do that, but only in the fraction of a second. It all has to cancel each other out and disappear again. On a larger scale, physics says this is impossible unless, again, you have an external energy source. And by definition, there's no external energy source outside the universe. So this whole business here about everything actually being nothing, you can write an equation that says that. You can write any kind of equation you want, but that doesn't mean that the world actually works that way. I'm down to just a couple of minutes left. Boy, I'm going to skip forward a bit. Since we're t um, the universe around us, it's been argued for many people, not just Christians or creationists, that the universe around us is very well fine-tuned for us to be here. And you can point to a lot of things about the Earth, which I'm going to skip, even the Moon, other planets in the solar system, our Sun. But on a larger scale, since we're in the context of the Big Bang, people are realizing that the Big Bang model requires a whole lot of things to be exceptionally well fine-tuned for us to be here looking at it all. Even things like the laws of chemistry. Sir Fred Hoyle, not a friend of creationists by any stretch of the imagination, looked at the properties of the carbon atom. I mean, there's a pretty geeky subject, right? Not many people are, are going to study this. He says some supercalculating inte intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom. Otherwise, the chance of finding such a thing through blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule. A common sense interpretation says that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics because it is so well tuned to, to support life. Other things. A change of as little as one half of a percent in the strength of the strong nuclear force, or four percent in the electric force, would destroy either nearly all carbon or all oxygen in every star, and hence the possibility of life as we know it. So we're talking some very small tweaks to laws of physics. If they were altered by even, even modest amounts, the universe would be different. If protons were 0.2 percent heavier, they'd decay into neutrons, destabilizing atoms. And by the way, if all the atoms in your body were to destabilize, that would be a bad thing. Just so, just so you know. Our universe and its laws appear to have a design that's tailor-made to support us. How extreme is this fine-tuning? Some people have calculated that the chances of getting the universe from this Big Bang, the universe that we see today, is 1 out of 10 to the 60th power. For illustration, suppose you wanted to fire a bullet at a 1-inch target on the other side of the observable universe, 20 billion light years away, your aim would have to be accurate to that same part in 1 to the 10 to the 60th. This is an older quote, though. Subsequent work on the Big Bang has revealed the problem is actually much worse than this. It's now up to 10 to the 123rd power. It's been likened to the odds of taking a, a finely sharpened pencil and balancing on its tip for 14 billion years <laughs> without falling over. Some of the fine-tuning in the universe appears to be extreme enough to be quite embarrassing. For example, we need to tune the dark energy to 123 decimal places to make habitable galaxies. Here's the number 10 to the 123rd. One out of that number is the chances of the universe coming out of this Big Bang, according to today's best models. So on the face of it, we would say that the Big Bang model doesn't withstand scrutiny very well either. However, I still got a couple of minutes, don't I? The secular crowd believes they have an explana explanation for this known as the multiverse. What is the multiverse? Multiverse means multiple universes, which we only live in one of. Remember Stephen Hawking said universes in that quote I, I read you. Well, how can there be more than one universe? I mean, universe by definition means everything. Well, they redefine the word to mean everything we can perceive, even in theory. So something that is outside of our perception could be considered a separate universe. And the secular crowd now says that there are multiple universes. In fact, certain implications of the Big Bang would say there's actually an infinite number of universes. The Big Bang, in its inflationary portion, would have produced not only our universe, but also a lot of other bubble universes which bubbled out of the Big Bang, each of which had different laws of physics in it. So yes, our universe with its laws of physics and all this fine tuning that I haven't even had time to share with you is extremely, extremely unlikely. But that's not a problem because there's an infinite number of universes to choose from. We just happen to be in this one that looks so unlikely. Implications of this. Think about this. Is there an... So, let me back up a minute. If there's an infinite number of universes out there, that means every possible combination of anything exists out there somewhere, right? That means that there's another planet Earth somewhere out there where we are all sitting in this room and you're listening to me talk and everything has been the same up until now except someone coughs now. 
And then at that point, histories diverge. There's another universe out there, a planet called Earth, orbiting the sun, same people, same room, where everything's the same except somebody had different, something different for breakfast this morning. There's a universe out there where the South won the Civil War. There's a universe out there where there never was a Civil War because the 13 colonies lost the revolution. On and on it goes. That's, this is the implication of multiverse theory, right? If there's an infinite number of universes out there, you get all possible combinations of history. This, uh, this author actually pointed out that, is there another copy of you reading this article? But deciding to put it aside while, while you are reading on. A person living on a planet called Earth, with misty mountains, fertile fields, and so on. This person has been identical to you in every respect until now, when you read on and he or she did not. And then your two lives split up. And then he goes on to, to point out, this idea does not even, is not even speculative anymore. This is mainstream in cosmology. It's the, uh, the direct prediction of most calculations and simulations presented at cosmology conferences. If space is infinite and this distribution of matter is sufficiently uniform, even the most unlikely events must take place somewhere. In particular, there are infinitely many other inhabited planets, including not just one, but infinitely many with people with the same appearance, name, and memories as you. <laughs> so you can never feel lonely ever again, right? <laughs> somewhere out there. So even the most unlikely events must take place somewhere. Implications of this, let's take this further. First of all, this makes logical reasoning impossible. Uh, the Big Bang actually can't support deductive or inductive reasoning. I don't have time to talk about this. Feel free to talk to me at the tables later if you want to ask why. I like to focus on a, a type of reasoning called abduction, which is not kidnapping. Abduction is the inference to the best explanation. The Big Bang model, take this logical conclusion, says this is invalid reasoning. Here's what I mean. Let's say you're at home and you go in the kitchen, you're, you're home alone, just you and the dog, and you're hungry, so you go in the kitchen to make a sandwich. And you finish the sandwich, and just as you're about to eat it, haven't taken a bite yet, the phone rings in the other room. Put the sandwich down, go answer the phone, come back in the room, this is what you see. <laughs> now, who gets in trouble here? Do you call up your neighbor and say, you got a lot of nerve sneaking into my kitchen, taking a bite of my sandwich, and sneaking back out again before I had a chance to catch you? No. Who gets in trouble? The dog, right? <laughs> Can you prove the dog did it? No, unless you have a video camera set up, or unless you want to examine the contents of the dog's stomach, which, yeah, we don't want to go there. But nevertheless, you're still certain that it was the dog. Why? Because the dog is the best explanation. That's what abduction means, the inference to the best explanation. And we use this reasoning all the time. Now, think about this. This multiverse thing says, well, the universe is extremely unlikely, but that's because there's an infinite number of many to choose from. We just happen to be in one that's unlikely. Well, if, if, someone, if I get a box in the mail and there's a violin inside of it, do I say, well, it's a, let's see. Here's a, what appears to be a well-designed, finely tuned instrument. Do I just, is the best explanation that I happen to live in a universe where wood was assembled by um, wind into this and strings were formed from steel or whatever by natural processes? Or is the best explanation that it was designed and tuned? A laptop. There's plastic, comes from petroleum. There's glass, comes from silica, beach sand. You could say, well, maybe there's a volcano which melted some beach sand which happened to form glass and then the wind and rain is assembled it into something. Is that the best explanation? No, it's a well-designed thing. That's because it had a designer. It's, the best explanation is not that we live in a multiverse. Is the best explanation for an airplane that there's a tornado in a junkyard which happened to assemble the parts into something that can fly? No. The fact that most unlikely events must take place somewhere according to the multiverse is not the best explanation. So, the same reasoning applies to the universe. The universe appears to be designed and finely tuned. The best explanation is that it has a designer and a fine tuner, not that we happen to live in a bunch of others. And we use this kind of reasoning every day. Example, there's a man standing in a courtroom before a judge. The judge says, the evidence against you is pretty severe. Do you have anything to say for yourself before this court passes judgment? The man says, well, your honor, I know it looks bad for me, but let me explain. I know that what appears to be my footprint was found at the scene of the crime. But you see, Your Honor, the wind and the rain must have eroded the soil into a shape that looks just like my footprint and matches the boots I'm wearing. And I know I was found close to the scene of the crime with a bag of identical things that were taken from the house that day. But you see, I just happened to be coming home from the store that day having bought all those items and thrown away the receipts in the boxes. And I know that a man who appeared to be me was seen in, there breaking into the house, but you see, genetics tells us that there's someone somewhere in the world that looks a lot like us, and that person 
who looks like me must have been there that day breaking into the house wearing the same clothing. Now, Your Honor, I know this is all extremely unlikely, but you have to remember that we live in a multiverse, and in the multiverse, even the most unlikely events must take place somewhere. So you have to let me go. Is the judge going to buy this explanation? No, that guy's going to jail, right? We consider such reasoning ridiculous in any other area of life. Why is it suddenly acceptable in cosmology? It's actually anti-science also because multiverse means there's all these other universes that we can't observe. If something is unobservable, that means it's outside of nature. What word did we say means something outside of nature? Supernatural. But that's why the Bible was discredited at the very beginning of the conversation, right? Because supernatural explanations aren't allowed. So now we're seeing hypocrisy in this, and even some secular astronomers are unhappy with this. I'm out of time, unfortunately. There's, there's more we could talk about with this. Um, I actually have quotes here from secular astronomers saying, well, multiverse means that there's intelligent dinosaurs on other planets. They're advanced, and we'd be better off not meeting them. I mean, <laughs> now, does, isn't this required, though? So Calvin and Hobbes, Tyrannosaurus Flying F-14, is at the documentary now, <laughs> right? This guy, this other um, article, if my computer would cooperate, it's not cooperating. <laughs> this article went so far as to say that our, our universe, this is a serious scientific article now in one of the most prestigious astronomy publications, our universe was created by life of superior intelligence existing in another physical universe. Our universe was created by aliens in a different universe. And then he goes on to explain why. This explains why the constants of physics have their observed finely tuned values. So the reason everything is so unlikely, why it looks like it was designed, is it was designed by aliens in a different universe. Quarterly Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society, one of the oldest scientific journals in the world. This is where science has gone. Now again, this is the logical implication of where Big Bang Theory has wound up. So if Big Bang Theory, taken to its logical conclusion, denies science, what does that say about the beginning assumptions? So we see then the secular model fails in its attempts to account for our origins. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. There's something badly wrong with our standard picture of the origin of galaxies. Compare this to the Bible, though. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spoke, and it was done. Secular astronomers say, nobody really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. The Bible says, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. Secular astronomer says, the formation of stars is one of the most fundamental problems in astrophysics. No current model can reproduce all the observations. That's because, as the Bible says, the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are God's ways higher than our ways. There are so many uncertainties in this picture, we do, we do not really have a theory of star formation. In fact, if stars did not exist, it would be easy to prove that this is what we expect. <laughs> One last quote. The universe we see when we look out to its furthest horizons contains 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies contains another 100 billion stars. That's 10 to the 22 stars all told. One, 22 zeros after it. That's how many stars there are. The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. There's no lack of ideas, of course. We just can't substantiate them. As the Bible says, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. So indeed, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, I've, I went fast tonight. I threw a lot of stuff at you in a lot of different topics. Um, I have two DVDs on the back table. The, so, the planets that I gave you a little, uh, little portion of, there's a full presentation. It goes planet by planet through the solar system. Like I said, each one discredits the secular model in a different way. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this one's really good for kids because there's 240 some odd photographs and animations in here. So it's very visual. Then uh, the, the material on stars and galaxies, there's a separate presentation just on that. That's the second DVD. The Big Bang material will, Lord willing, be in a separate DVD later on next year. And whether or not you're interested in those, I invite you. I have a sign-up sheet. I have a free email newsletter um, periodically as different things are announced in astronomy. Um, I like to tell you, you know, what you're not being told. Yes, they announced this, but here's the other part of the information that somehow didn't make it out there. So if you like this kind of perspective on astronomy, I, will, I invite you to sign up for that. And I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Spike. I uh, hope you found that very infor good information for you that you can use. Um, I know we're running a little late, but uh, if let's take two questions, two important questions. Who has some um, questions that didn't get answered yet? Ben. Um, people like Hugh Ross and Hank Handegraaff claim that people like Hugh Ross and Hank Handegraaff claim that we need to uh, believe nature, and nature says that the Bible cannot be true because the stars and the universe has to be old and it couldn't be young. Uh, I don't think uh, the two gentlemen you mentioned would say that we can't believe the Bible. Uh, they believe they're defending the Bible, uh, but they do so in such a way that we have to accept what nature says. Um, the question is, does nature say that? The, the evidence we have are observations. The conclusions are interpretations of the observations. So nature doesn't say anything. Sci scientists looking at nature say things. Now the question is, are their interpretations correct? In order to, make the, to reach the conclusions that they reach, they have to make certain assumptions along the way. Um, I focus most of my attention tonight on secular astronomers who would say, regardless of their personal beliefs, at least in their professional approach, they say everything formed by itself using only natural processes. My goal tonight was to show that there's a lot of problems with that approach. Someone like Hugh Ross would say something different. He would say, uh, it's still billions of years old, but God took a direct hand at certain points along the way. Um, and if I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting Dr. Ross's views here, but I believe he would say that God sat back for part of the time, but then periodically would intervene in sort of short bursts of creative activity, so to speak, and then guide the universe into, into evolving the way that it did. Uh, now, people like Dr. Ross and Hank Hanegraaff tends to accept pronouncements from people like Dr. Ross. They have largely accepted the secular way of looking at things. Uh, in my Big Bang presentation, going into more detail, I show there's a fundamental assumption at the heart of the Big Bang model that you have to do before you can apply any interpretation or any math at all. And that's uh, the question of does the universe have a center of mass? We see everything in the sky. In order to produce a cosmology from that, and there's more than one available, by the way, the Big Bang is not the only one out there, um, you have to first decide, is there a center of mass? Because if there is or there isn't, that affects where the math goes. Before, before you can apply Einstein's relativity to the universe, you have to see, is there a center of mass or not? The Big Bang says no. And that's fundamentally a, um, an anti-theistic assumption. They're saying there can be no center of mass because there, a center of mass would be a special place, and there can be no special places because a special, special places implies, you know, has, has theistic implications. So I hope, I hope I'm not getting too confusing in this answer. Um, the, the secular way of looking at things makes certain assumptions at the, the very beginning that aren't even commonly spoken about because they're so fundamental. I'm not sure Dr. Ross even recognizes that those assumptions are being made. I've spoken to him and was not very successful in talking about underlying assumptions on things. As for the, the age question specific, um, n not only answering your question, does anybody else want to discuss the question of how could light get here if it, if it would take millions or billions of years to arrive? If you were, well, is, is that also part of your question? Okay, good. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that now and then. Hopefully it'll... Getting back to the issue I raised a moment ago, was there a center of mass to the universe? Big Bang model says no. Uh, secular astronomers all say no. That's, it's called the cosmological principle. And like I said, fundamental to everything else that, that goes on from that point up. Bible-believing Bible -believing physicist named Dr. Russell Humphreys uh, was reading the Bible one day and Notice that some 17 different places the Bible says God stretched out the heavens. And you get to wondering, was that poetry or was that an actual description of what God did? If God did it that way, what would that look like? Well, if he stretched out the heavens, then that means earth, then that the heavens started out in a smaller volume. He realized that if the universe was in a small enough volume initially, and if it had a center of mass, which as a Bible believer he doesn't have a problem with, he said, fine, there can be a center of mass, what would that then look like? Well, then you apply Einstein's relativity to that and you come up with something very interesting. So, um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the, the problem I'm going to address now is the question of how can we see things that are apparently so far away that it would take millions of years for the light to get here if the universe is young? 
Now, I didn't say in my presentation that the universe is young. I said the solar system is young. That's only one part of the universe. I think that um, we have young age locally, and things are a little different further out, but I'll, uh, I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. I'm showing you a galaxy here that's about 55 million light years away. In other words, light would take 55 million years to get here from there. Um, so why can we see it then if there hasn't been that long to look at it? Well, several options for this. You can say that the speed of light has changed, perhaps, in the past. I don't care for that option myself. Uh, most people no longer do. You can say that the speed of light is different in different parts of space. That's another assumption that people are making that's not commonly recognized. And even some secular people are wondering about that, by the way. That also would change. So for example, it's difficult to go backwards in this. We see an object that's far away from us. In between us and it is empty space. How fast does light go through empty space? We don't know. We've only ever measured light within our solar system because this is where we live and we've never been outside of our solar system. Every photon we've ever measured with a piece of lab gear or a telescope or whatever it may be has been inside our solar system, inside of the sun's gravitational field and inside the Milky Way itself. Can light potentially travel more quickly through deep space unaffected by gravity? There are several people asking that question. If it could, then light could get here a lot in a lot shorter time, right? Because it leaves the galaxy moving more slowly, moves quickly through the quickly than we're used to thinking of it moving through the intervening space, and then at a slower rate once it uh, enters gravi gravitational fields. That's a complicated question, by the way. There's a lot of implications to that that a lot of people are, are working out right now. I'm just presenting it as a possible explanation that several people are looking at, including some secular scientists. So that's one possibility. Number two is that God created light in transit. He S S Spike, l let me suggest that sure. we wrap this up here. I, I know oh. you're, you're working on another DVD, which is going to explain a lot of this in much more oh, detail. I want to answer the question. I, I, no, I, I, I know, but... <laughs> And you know, there, there are books out there that describe some of this uh, astronomy as well. They're different models. Two minutes? Two minutes? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Option three is time dilation. And there are books back there. Is Chris? Did you, do you have copies of Starlight and Time? He does. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's a book about what I'm about to describe to you if you want more information. This gets back to Dr. Russell Humphreys, the Bible believing physicist I mentioned. He realized, being a physicist who's familiar with relativity, gravity affects time. And this is well known in physics. I'm showing you a picture here of a GPS satellite. It being f um, further out from Earth's gravitational field than we are down here on the surface, clock, its clocks tick at a little bit different rate than ours do. Turns out that gravity slows time down. And we've measured this a lot of different ways. We have atomic clocks at sea level in Annapolis, Maryland, and one in Boulder, Colorado, about a mile above. The one at sea level ticks slightly more slowly as predicted by Einstein's relativity. Now, this isn't something that affects us in our normal life, but it does affect the model of the universe if God stretched everything out. Because, okay, quick sum summation of the model. Here's the universe in a small volume. If that volume was small enough at the very beginning of Genesis week, the universe would be in a black hole. Now, that doesn't matter so much because there's nothing outside the black hole. Now God starts stretching the heavens, the universe's volume increases, the, air, the uh, volume of the black hole decreases because density of the, the matter is decreasing. Now inside is all the stuff, galaxies and stars, etc. are starting to form. Eventually, as God keeps stretching the universe, some of the material moves outside of the black hole horizon. So now this stuff is inside a black hole, this stuff is outside, now it gets interesting. We're still in, the, in, in here somewhere, by the way, at this point in creation. Because there's a black hole effect, relativity says time flows differently on either side of this boundary. So time is going very slowly here, much more rapidly out here. This is a direct prediction of relativity as it, uh, as it applies to a distribution of mass this way. So God continues stretching. The universe gets bigger, black hole smaller. Again, we're still in the middle, so very little time has passed for us here. Much more time has passed out there. Eventually, when the universe is big enough, the black hole shrinks down far enough where it disappears. Now, all clocks everywhere are ticking at the same rate. But a lot more time passed before out here than here. So you can have 6,000 years pass here on Earth according to a clock on Earth, whereas 
a few hundred million years passed out here because its clocks flowed, flowed, bad word, but you ticked yeah. at a more rapid rate. Now that's, that's a complicated idea. Again, there's, there's books out there that explain it in a lot more detail than what I did. But that's the, the basic idea behind several models that are being pursued now. Does, rel does relativity allow clocks to flow at different rates? Yes. Depending on how God did it in the beginning, could it could give that light time to get here, even though it's been a short time as measured by a clock on Earth. And I'm, I'm sorry for abusing the, the clock. <laughs> Thank you.